We should see, of course, that the same inverse relationship we observed in our demand schedule is observable in our demand curve. You can notice that at higher prices, the quantity demanded is very low, but as the price falls, the quantity demanded for candy bars increases. Hence, we can see that there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. While it may seem obvious, it's worth stating that the relationship between the price and the quantity demanded of goods is pretty predictable. And in fact, there are very few, if any, goods that this relationship would not hold for. For example, anytime the price of anything falls, think about airline tickets or cellular phone plans or laptop computers, it would be expected that the number of these products that consumers would wish to buy would increase. So the total market demand for any good should always demonstrate an inverse relationship between the price and the quantity that people wish to buy. This relationship is so strong and predictable that in economics, we, we can actually call it a law. And in fact, this relationship is known as the law of demand. Now, if you're a beginning economics student, you may have learned a term in the first unit of the course called ceteris paribus. This is very important when we talk about the law of demand because the relationship between price and quantity strong enough to be considered a law only when all else is held equal. So when we say Federalist Paradise, what we mean is that we're assuming that nothing else is changing, like the income of consumers, or the price of related goods, or the expectations of consumers regarding future prices or future income levels, and so on. So the law of demand actually starts with the words Ceteris Paribus. So we say that Ceteris Paribus, in other words, all else equal, there is an inverse relationship between price quantity demanded for all goods, services, and since we talk about both product and resource markets in economics, we must also include productive resources. the law of demand. Ceteris paribus, there is an inverse relationship between the price and the quantity demanded for goods, services, and resources. In other words, at high prices, the quantity that consumers will wish to buy is low, while at lower prices, the quantity that consumers wish to buy increases and is therefore higher. The relationship is inverse. And this, of course, is always going to be illustrated by a downward sloping demand curve, illustrating the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. At high prices, low quantities are demanded, but at low prices, greater and greater quantities of goods and services will be demanded because more and more consumers can afford to buy the cheaper goods. Now, it may seem like common sense that at lower prices, people wish to buy greater quantities of goods and services. But as economists, we always have to make things a little bit more complicated than they are in real life. So economists have come up with three economic reasons for the law of demand. And I'll call these the economic rationale for the inverse relationship between the price and the quantity demanded. The first of these is known as the income effect. The explanation of the income effect is that as the price of a good falls, even if consumers' income stays the same, the purchasing power of their income increases. In other words, let's say the price of a Red Bull falls from $4 to $2. Even if my allowance has stayed the same, I can actually afford more Red Bulls now because they're cheaper. So my real income, in other words, the amount of goods that my nominal income can buy actually increases when the price falls. This is known as the income effect. Of course, the opposite holds true that if the price of a Red Bull goes from $4 to $6, it's as if my income has fallen. And as I feel poorer, I therefore buy less Red Bull. The second economic rationale for the law of demand 
is called the substitution effect. This can be explained by the fact that most goods and services have substitutes, which means that there are other goods that are similar that consumers could buy instead of those goods that we're talking about. So let's talk about Red Bull again. If the price of Red Bull falls, other energy drinks, even though their prices stay the same, appear to be getting more expensive. For example, Monster Energy Drink might be $4 a can, just like Red Bull. But when the price of a Red Bull falls to $2 a can, Monster suddenly seems more expensive. So the chances are I'm going to substitute more Red Bull and less Monster Energy Drink. The same holds true, of course, if the price of Red Bull rises. Even if Monster Energy Drink stays the same, Red Bull goes up to, say, $6 a can. Monster appears cheaper, even though the price of Monster hasn't fallen. Therefore, I'm likely to substitute more Monster into my consumption and less Red Bull, since Red Bull is now more expensive. This is known as a substitution effect, and it helps explain why demand is downward sloping. Finally, the third economic rationale for the law of demand is known as the law of diminishing marginal utility. I know this is a little confusing. We're using one economic law to explain another economic law. But this is another very fundamental concept in economics. Utility, as you may know, is what economists use to call happiness. Happiness, utility, these basically mean the same thing. Now, when it comes to consumption of goods and services, it seems like there may not be so much, such a thing as too much of anything. But in fact, most consumers, the more they have a particular good, the less and less they enjoy each additional unit. Now, this is basically the law of diminishing marginal utility. Let's use Red Bull again. I love Red Bull. When I'm on my way up to the mountains to ski on the weekend, I like to stop and grab a can of Red Bull when I fill my gas tank. But why don't I buy five cans of Red Bull? The reason, of course, is that after I've had one can of Red Bull, the second can just doesn't take, taste quite, quite as good. And, of course, if I had to try to drink five Red Bulls in the morning, I would be sick to my stomach after the second or third Red Bull, so I just don't bother. So the, the, the rationale here is that in order for me to be willing to buy more Red Bulls, the price of Red Bull would certainly have to get lower and lower. Because at $4 a can, the value I place on the first Red Bull may be, I don't know, $5. But the second Red Bull I drink, I don't enjoy it as much as the first one. Therefore, I wouldn't be willing to pay more than, say, $3 for it. But the price is $5. So the only four dollars. So the only way that I would be willing to buy a second, a third, and a fourth can of Red Bull is if those Red Bulls got cheaper. So the law of diminishing marginal utility is this idea that the more I have of something, the less value I attach to each additional unit. This helps explain why at high prices I'd only be willing to buy one or two Red Bulls. But as the price falls, my willingness to consume them increases, just as the utility or the happiness I get out of additional units or cans of Red Bull in this case, decreases. Therefore, the price has to decrease in order for me to wish to buy more. So here we have the three economic reasons or rationales behind the law of demand. The income effect, the substitution effect, the law of diminishing marginal utility. These can be used to explain the shape of the demand curve, which is downward sloping, which, of course, illustrates the relationship between the price of any good